I wonder if you've ever had the experience where familiarity has taken away the sense of wonder of something. Perhaps it's a view that when you saw it the first time, it just took your breath away, perhaps like the one over my shoulder. But when you've seen it 10, 20, 100 times, it doesn't have the same impact. Or perhaps it's a piece of music that when you first heard it moved you to tears and now it can play in the background and you barely bat an eyelid. I wonder if some of us have become familiar with scripture, with hearing God's word, of reading God's word. Perhaps we have multiple copies of the Bible and we're, we're just used to turning to it. Or perhaps we're used to hearing it spoken of and explained in many different contexts. And if we're honest, we've just become a bit familiar with it. Well, our reading today begins with a staggering few words that really should rock us back on our heels. It begins by saying the word of the Lord came to Jonah. And it's a repeat of uh, something that occurred in chapter one, where the same phrase is the word of the Lord comes to Jonah. Um, but in chapter three, there is the addition of three little words. And it reads, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time, a second time. And that speaks of God's amazing grace to Jonah. Well, before Isabel McFerrin reads Jonah three for us and then Andrew Morgan explains the passage to us, we're going to pray. And we're going to pray that we will not be familiar with God's word. But as we hear it today, we would have a hunger for it. We would have a sense of expectation that God's word would come to us wherever we are this morning. And it would come to us with a sense of wonder. So let's pray. Father, we praise you that your word is not limited. We thank you that although we are scattered in multiple different locations, you can speak to all of us as your word is open. As we look into the Bible, as we hear it read and then explained, your word is coming to us, your people in 2020. And we ask the help of your Holy Spirit to listen, to understand and then to respond that we might be staggered with awe and wonder that the God who created this universe, the God who sustains all things, the God who is mighty and powerful and glorious and holy should come and speak to us. We pray, fill us afresh with your word today. In Jesus name. Amen. Well, let's hear God's word read. Jonah 3, Isabel McFerrin is going to read to us. Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. Then the word of God came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on a sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they had turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. This is the third sermon in a series of four sermons based on the book of Jonah a book where God chooses to work out his purposes through a rather reluctant prophet. The series is fittingly called Amazing Grace and shows God repeatedly displaying generous mercy and stepping in to save. 
In chapter 1, Running from God, Jonah is told by God to go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. Instead, he runs away, takes a boat heading in the opposite direction and gets caught in a storm, is thrown overboard and is swallowed by a big fish that God provided to save him. The sea goes calm and the pagan sailors he is sailing with are saved from the storm too. Last week, a cry from the deep. Jonah, who was saved from drowning, is reconciled to God while in the belly of a huge fish. And in today, this week, judgment withheld. We will see God showing compassion and relenting from the destruction he has decreed from Nineveh. So it's a book about amazing grace. This week, no difference, they'll be saved from judgment. And yet its central character, Jonah, is far from amazing and distinctly lacking in grace. In the opening verses of the book, in chapter 1, we read, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Instead, Jonah legs it in the other direction and takes a boat heading for Tarshish. Instead of dropping him, though, God rescues him. They're reconciled and Jonah is sent a second time to Nineveh to deliver God's judgment on them. We know though from the end of this book that there's still a level of reluctance in Jonah. He may be obedient but he feels that the Ninevites should just get what is coming to them. Nineveh was a wicked violent city. It's described by Nahum as a city of blood full of lies full of plunder, ever with victims, many casualties, piles of dead, corpses, wanton lust of a prostitute, witchcraft. Richard Cokin in his book on Jonah, The Reluctant Prophet, also comments that they were spiritually clueless. Jonah reckoned that if he preached to them that they might well change their ways and God, true to character, might well have compassion on them. To Jonah, the idea that God might show mercy to this vile, pagan, violent group of people was unfair and very wrong, chapter 4, verse 1. Now, we're going to look at Jonah chapter 3 this morning, and we're going to look at it in three sections. The first section, verses 1 to 4, Jonah is resent. Verses 4 to 9, the Ninevites repent. And then in verse 10, God relents. So Jonah is resent. Jonah is far from perfect but at this point in the narrative, in this point in the book, as a clear indicator of his reconciliation to God, Jonah obeys. We read that in verses 1 to 3. The word of the Lord comes a second time to Jonah, go to the great city of Nineveh, and we read that Jonah obeys the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Matthew Henry comments that Jonah's commission is renewed and now readily obeyed. God's making use of us is the best evidence of his being at peace with us. Without murmuring and disputing, Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh. Now, if I were God, after Jonah's turnaround, I might have been tempted to make the task a little easier for him in recognition of our reconciliation. However, Matthew Henry writes, God does not alter the message to gratify Jonah or make it more passable with him. No, he must now preach the very same that he was then ordered to preach and would not. Richard Cokin helpfully comments that the Lord did not negotiate with Jonah. Now, through grace, we know that at our time, we might well be able to call God Abba Father but he is still Lord, he is still sovereign, he is still over all. There is no negotiating. It's the same task, the same mission. And it was a tough mission. Jonah versus Nineveh, an unknown man, let me say, these Ninevites would not have known him, with a message from an ignored and largely unknown God. And all this pitted against the Assyrian city of Nineveh, a pagan city, said known for its idolatry and violence. 
God doesn't need Jonah to do his work and after chapter 1 we could quite understand why God might look elsewhere. But as Paul would later write in his, one of his letters to the Corinthians, God pours his greatest messages into the weakest of vessels. It's about the message, it's not about the messenger. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. It's not Jonah versus Nineveh. It's Jonah with God, with God's message to Nineveh. Now many of us can find encouragement in Jonah that God can and does use the weak and frail and that he gives us second chances too, just like he gave to Jonah. Jonah has truly changed. What he vowed to do in the belly of the fish, he's making good on. In verse 9, he says he will, he will be obedient and now he's making good on that. It's one thing to commit to something at the point of a crisis. It's quite another thing to follow through on that. He's vomited onto dry land at the end of chapter 2. He's covered with the innards, props of a, of a fish stomach, relieved perhaps to be alive. And then there's many days of journey ahead before it's the same message to the same people. I could quite understand why Jonah would be reluctant. Or would I? My reluctance perhaps would be based on fear. Perhaps there was an element of fear for Jonah. My reluctance might be to do with the disruption it is to my life and there may be an element of that with Jonah. But Jonah's main reluctance was because he felt the Ninevehs, quite frankly, didn't deserve God's mercy. And if he preached judgment, perhaps they would repent and God would be merciful. But this city mattered to God. This city was on God's heart, not because of its political and commercial status, but just because there were so many people there who didn't know him, who were not saved. Now, if we're a Christian listening this morning, perhaps we might see there's a parallel between Jonah's calling and our calling to evangelism. Our Nineveh may not be 120,000 people, but it might be the town that we live in. It might be our neighbours, it might be our colleagues, or the class we're in at school, the set of friends we have at universities, or in our apprenticeships course, our family, our hockey team. Our Nineveh are simply people who don't know God and need to know God. There are parallels for us here, but our message is different. Our message is good news. It's God's mercy as well as his wrath. It's God's wrath being turned away and debts being paid. Vaughan Roberts, in his commentary on this book, noted that evangelism is a gift. It's a gift of grace. And along with other commentators, he also noted that God didn't work in Nineveh until Jonah was ready. And he wondered if there was, and I quote, a Nineveh waiting for us. They don't know they're waiting for us, but they're waiting for us to pray, to act, to speak. What's stopping us? What's stopping me? Is that fair on those who are waiting? Verses 1 to 4 then, Jonah is resent. Verses 4 to 9, the Ninevites repent. Now the image we have of Jonah is not entirely positive. He's reluctant, he's disobedient, he's plain daft trying to run away from God. And he's weak, he's sinful, he's a man like us. And yet we read that he's incredibly effective. On hearing Jonah's message, the entire city of Nineveh repents, and in great humility. Verse 8, let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Why? Because in verse 5 we read, they believed God. It's as simple as that. They believed God when he said that 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown or destroyed. The message in verse 4. They didn't take issue with the message. The verdict was fair. Now it's unlikely that, that verse 4 is all that Jonah said. 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. It might simply be a summary of his message or, or a conclusion. 
he might well have mentioned the boat, his journey there, the storm, the, the time in the, the belly of a fish. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know what else he said. But the key thing is that he is not the message and he didn't get in the way of the message. His message is simple, it's clear, unsophisticated, and it goes straight to their hearts. We don't read in verse 5 that the Ninevites came to a point where they believed in God. We read in verse 5 that they believed God. Many of us have friends, families, colleagues who believe in God, believe in someone higher than ourselves, believe in some other that's out there. But that's not faith. It requires nothing of someone to believe in God. Faith is believing God's word. Believing in such a way that it impacts, that it changes our lives. The Ninevites believed God, believed the verdict he had on them. They believed that Jonah's message was from God, a God of absolute holiness who cannot tolerate sin. And that was enough to cause them to repent. They understood their need for divine mercy and grace. No other mercy or grace would do apart from the divine. But there's no presumption there. Let everyone urgently call on God, verse 8, and God, verse 9, may relent. But they were repenting anyway because they were wicked. The decree to fast and repent came from the king who realised, and I quote Matthew Henry, that he and his people had become obnoxious to God's wrath. They repented because he and his people had become obnoxious to God's wrath. Now perhaps the most uncomfortable thing about Jonah's summarised message for us is not to do with what he left out, so much as what was left in. I, we, tend to be happy to share the gospel in terms of what people are saved to rather than what they are saved from. But the message of God's mercy is a little empty if we're not mentioning God's wrath. If God's wrath is not real, then mercy is not needed. However, his judgment is coming and it is real, it is fair. Maybe not in 40 days, maybe less, maybe more. But he is coming, his judgment is coming and his holiness remains absolute. The Ninevites understood this and they repented and God saw in verse 10 how they turned from their evil ways. The king's decree, let me say, in verse 6 was actually confirming what was already taking place. You can see that it wasn't Jonah that reached the king but rather the message. When Jonah's warning, we read in verse 6, reached the king. People were hearing this message and they were passing it on. It gripped their hearts and they were telling their neighbours. When Jonah's message and his warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne and in humility he took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in dust. There was repentance at every level of society. Sackcloth and ashes and fasting for everyone. The repentance was real, it was evidenced by action. There were external symbols of internal change that was taking place. This was revival. 120,000 people, we read for chapter 4, verse 10. 120,000 people repenting. That's a population of Warwick, Leamington and Kenilworth combined. So the big story of Jonah is not the big fish. The big story of Jonah is one about revival, one about 120,000 people turning to God. Jonah is resent, Nineveh repents, and in verse 10, God relents. There was nothing the people of Nineveh could do to make them fit for God. For all of verse 8, sackcloth, calling on God and giving up evil ways, they could never stand before his holiness on their own merit. But God is sovereign and he's in total control and does as he pleases. And he decides to withhold judgment. Verse 10, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. It's not God acting on a whim, 
It's entirely in line with his character. Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Anyone who knew God knew that he was a God of compassion. Psalm 103, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. This is our sovereign God. But if God is sovereign, does that not render our actions meaningless? Nick Esch, a Baptist pastor in Texas, right, that his sovereignty is an actual fact what makes our actions meaningful, not meaningless. That's true in prayer, evangelism and everything else. Some say, why pray if God is sovereign? But a quest better question is, why pray if he is not? God is sovereign and our prayer matters because God, in his sovereignty, answers them, working his will for his glory and our good. Jonah is resent, Nineveh repents, God relents. It's amazing grace and in this chapter we see judgment withheld. Verses 1 to 4, Jonah is resent, he's given that second chance as we are and for us we have mercy as well as wrath to talk about evangelism is a gift it's a gift of grace Nineveh repents the book of Jonah is about revival about people believing God's word they're deserving of God's wrath and they're repenting God relents first 10 which is entirely in keeping with his character we have to accept God as he is revealed in his words in scripture, full of wrath as well as full of mercy. He's Abba Father, but he is still Lord. He's holy and removed, and yet he reaches out and wants to touch us. He's able to reach people that we are in contact with. He's Lord, but he's also Saviour. Matthew 12, and also in Luke 11, we read that the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, says Jesus. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something far greater than Jonah is here. And we're living in that time of grace. The Ninevites believed God. Let's pray that our friends, family, colleagues also believe God, not just believe in God. Let's pray they will embrace his message of wrath as well as mercy. Because of what Jesus has achieved on the cross, something greater than Jonah is here. We have good news to share. Evangelism is a gift. This weekend, my family, the Morgan household, is coming to the end of an era. Due to a number of reasons, mostly connected to the pandemic, we've been thrown together as a family of five again for quite a considerable period of time. And that period of time is now coming to an end. New chapters in our lives are opening up. Our sons are moving on to different places. Our circumstances will change. Different people will come into our lives, into my life, and we will enter their lives. And so it goes on. Nothing particularly unusual about that. But don't you look back sometimes and ponder how you arrived at where you are now? Have you ever wondered whether God, in his sovereignty, might have put you where you are now. The book of Jonah seems so amazing. He's thrown overboard, as we said, at precise, precise the right time and place, such that a particularly large fish would have been passing and be able to swallow him. A fish who had an appetite for humans and didn't chew his food properly. That fish would then have to swim in the right direction and spit out Jonah at the right place for him to get to Nineveh. Amazing. But is that really any more amazing than the accumulation of instances, decisions, outside influences and circumstances that have brought you to where you are today, that have brought me to where I am, to precisely where we are? We need to ask God, in his sovereignty, has he put us here for a reason? They might not know it, but there are people in our lives who are depending on us to share 
God's message with them. They also have been precisely placed into contact with us through a similarly mesmerizing set of steps so that we can deliver God's word of grace to them. Now it's easy to point the finger at Jonah and his almost comic attempt at running away from God's call, his disobedience. The uncomfortable truth though is that this book is written for our instruction as well as for our encouragement. While Jonah had to repent of his active defiance, perhaps we need to repent of our passive defiance. There are people in our lives who need to hear God's message of wrath, wrath and mercy, and we're simply not delivering. But with God's sovereign equipping, we can do this. We can be, be obedient. We can embrace the gift of evangelism and pass it on. Now we can see much of Jonah in ourselves, contradictions, objections, hypocrisy, inconsistencies, disobedience and frailty. And that's why I, that's why we are so grateful for this book. We may be striving to become more like Christ, but currently, like Jonah, we feel we're far from amazing and often lacking in grace. But God used Jonah and therefore God can use us. He can use me. He can use you. In fact, he wants to use me. In fact, he wants to use you to show his all-surpassing power. Paul writes to the Corinthians then, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not us. We are not the message. The message is God's word. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 7, in the message, another paraphrase of the Bible, reads as follows. We carry this precious message around in the unadorned clay pots of our ordinary lives. That's to prevent anyone from confusing God's incomparable power with us. We carry this message around in the unadorned clay pots of our ordinary lives, but we need to pass that message on. As we've opened God's word together today, I wonder what he has said to you. How has the word of the Lord come to you? Why not take a moment to, to pause and reflect on that? If you're with others, you could talk about it now. Maybe you could send a message, uh, perhaps on a text or WhatsApp message uh, to friends and say, wow, this is what God has said to me today. Perhaps it's something you'll follow up with friends um, uh, during the week. But uh, good to keep before us. What has God said to us today? Let's not be familiar with God's word and discount it, but hungry for it and responsive to it. Our last song gives us an opportunity to respond to the holiness of God. And its words blend together the glory and otherness and power and majesty of God alongside his tenderness that comes to rescue us and invites us to call him Father. Let's sing together, Only a Holy God. <laughs> 